It's difficult to sign with this in my hand. So first of all, thank you for inviting me to come today um, to give this presentation to talk about sign language. The focus um, of my talk is on sign language morphology and how it has been used to create access to science education. It's not just myself that's been involved in this um, work. Um, we are the, we are, I am one of a, a team of three key people who, um, who work together and we've had funding from um, a variety of different sources to help us in our project work. This is the team up here on the screen. I think it's important I let you know that BSL is not signed English. It is not English on the hands. It's a natural developed language that over time has evolved just like any other language. It has its own grammar, its own structure, it has its own phonology and morphology. There is not a, a specific sign for individual words. So let me give you an example. This phrase, I have not seen you for a long time. So that's a, a considerable number of words, but let me show you how that works in sign language. That's the sign for that sentence. So it's just two signs, that's all. And this is the timeline in BSL over my shoulder. I point to my eye. This hand shape represents an absence of something, and that forward movement indicates have not seen you for a long time. BSL has metaphors, it has poetry, it has regional variation, and that's actually often linked to the location of schools throughout the UK in a process called schoolisation. So why did we decide that we needed to develop some BSL signs for scientific topics? Really, it was about accessing science education. You know, for deaf people, for teachers of deaf children, for their family, for interpreters who work with deaf people. And previously, there was a strong oral policy in education of the deaf, and sign language was not permitted in these schools. But eventually, um, th this seemed to create barriers for deaf children um, attaining success through exams. So the, the, the policy was changed, and now pupils are allowed to sign, deaf pupils are allowed to sign in their exams. Let me give you a little brief history of how we've come to this point in deaf education. The first deaf school in the UK was here in Edinburgh, very close to where the Scottish Parliament is now. And there in that very early days deaf school, the teachers were using sign language. Now, then after that, in 1880, there was a conference in Milan that banned sign language in the education of the deaf, and only oral methods had to be used. They had taken this idea from the education system in Germany, and after that, the attainment of deaf children started to decline in education. Then, in 2003, BSL got recognised as a full and entire language. And just three years ago, here in Scotland, which was great news, the BSL Act was passed, which meant that the deaf community, deaf children and adults can have full access to public services in sign language. And really, what's interesting is this research that's shown that both hearing and deaf children show similar e uh, levels of attainment in the early years, but as the language becomes more complicated, deaf children's attainment gets frozen because they're unable to access complicated concepts through lip reading and spoken language. This is a photo, an example of what actually happens in exams in Scotland when deaf pupils are being assessed. And so you have a, a communication support worker who is reading an English text and signing the questions to the pupil who responds in sign language. Now, through Mary Brennan's work, she campaigned tirelessly to allow deaf children to access the educational system through sign language. And in 2003, that was finally approved. 
but unfortunately there is no minimum qualification set for the communication support workers who work with deaf children. It's simply seen to be enough that somebody can sign. And actually only 9% of teachers of deaf children have level 3 or above PSL. That's roughly equi equivalent to a higher qualification or an advanced hire. But 57% of deaf children prefer to access information through sign, but there's only 9% of teachers that are qualified to a level that allows them to do that. So, the three of us that I showed you in the first slide decided that we would set up a project to develop signs linked to the school curriculum. Because of course, often in curricular subjects, it's not everyday vocabulary that's being used. So we worked together. We've already managed to create over 1,000 signs on the topics of astronomy, biology, chemistry, geography, maths, and physics. So what we do is we film the sign, but we also film a definition of the sign in BSL to explain the meaning of the, of the word, the term that we have, have created a sign for. We additionally create laboratory movies because sometimes it, just looking at an individual sign is not sufficient to get the full definition. And sometimes even the definition can be difficult for technical terms. So a laboratory movie uh, sets the sign in context. All of our work starts in BSL and then later it is translated into English. And that goes against the norm because typically any kind of work related to sign language starts with English forms and then is translated into BSL. But we decided to do it the other way around. So the three of us decided that we would set some principles for our glossary project. We wanted it to be deaf led and not just any deaf person, but deaf experts in the scientific field that we were working on, and fluent signers. They all had a broad knowledge of science, maths, or the specific technical subject that we were working on, and they were accompanied by BSL linguists. We decided we wouldn't use initialized signs. Because previously, with technical signs, if there wasn't an established sign for a technical word, then they would rely on finger spelling. So we decided to avoid that system in our work. And we took as many real life examples of signs that were already in use out there in the community and incorporated them into the glossary where appropriate. We don't have time to go through the names of all these um, deaf uh, linguists and scientists, but this is the group that have worked together. They're from all over the UK, and they have different skills and qualifications in scientific subjects and BSL linguistics. This is an example of what happens in one of our sign development workshops. In particular, this one was focusing on maths. So what process do we follow? Well, we start by looking at a specific area of the curriculum, and we collect the words, the vocabulary, and the technical terms that we are going to need to develop signs for. Then we look out into the broader community and see if there are already existing signs for some of these terms. We evaluate the sign, and if we feel it's appropriate, then we incorporate it into the, the, the glossary. If, however, we feel it isn't contextually correct, then we can modify it before it goes into the glossary. And if we have no sign at all for the technical term, then we have to create a new one. And it's all based, all the new signs have semantic and morphological links. And once the, the, the work is finished, we disseminate the, the films to the team and we make sure that everybody is happy about it. Once we're all agreed that these are the appropriate signs, we upload them to our website. This is an example of a list of terms that we collect, collected from the curriculum along with definition so that we could be absolutely sure that our sign, the signs that we develop are appropriate to the context of the terminology. 
for one of the workshops, we had a scientific artist come in and work with us. This is, this is an example from our stem cell vocabulary workshop. And this, this individual, he was able to illustrate some of the concepts for us. As a deaf working group, of course, we rely on visual information. So that really helped us to develop signs. Because a lot of BSL signs are what we describe as iconic. So it really helps if we can see what the actual real life thing is that we're trying to develop a sign for. And then we often create mind maps that indicate the kind of links between particular um, items of terminology. And that guides us um, in how we develop the new signs. I'm just going to talk a little bit about that. Now, I'm hoping that some of you here are experts in chemistry. Nobody? Oh, OK, well, I'll teach you something new today then. So you can see all these terms. We had in our working group two expert chemists who identified these as a family of terms. I'm just going to show you a video clip. So you can see all the different terms that were covered there, and the family of signs were very similar. The movement was different for different terms. There's clear locations set up for product and reactant. So we start from the green circle there on the screen, and we finish at the red circle for all of these signs. And that indicates chemical reaction. Reversible chemical reactions, you, the sign moves over to the red circle and then back, indicating that it can be reversed. So you can see that it's a whole family of signs here um, that are linked conceptually. If we move on to physics for some other examples, anyone here expert in physics? One or two, I can see a couple of hands going up, that's good. It's interesting, when the group got together and we created our list of terms, we saw mass, and then weight, and then density formed a natural family. They were all closely linked as concepts. So we went on to discuss them in the working group. So we have to think about form and meaning. So for mass, remember mass is something that is not affected um, by movement, it just exists there. So this is the sign for mass. Mass, that's it. It's just an object. There it is. No movement, nothing acting on it. Mass. And when we went on to consider the term for weight, that of course is mass that has been acted upon by gravity, so the sign has a downward movement. So what do you think the sign could be? Not bad, not bad, that's a good attempt. This is the sign for weight. You're right about the downward movement because of the force of gravity acting on mass. A density, any ideas? No? Density. Still, we're using the sign for mass. And then the other hand is indicating volume. So all of these um, signs are linked with that root sign for mass to create a family of signs that really indicates the concepts very clearly. So we've got mass, weight, and density. So we're very careful when we're creating our science to make sure that meaning and it comes across clearly in a visual way. Now going to back to maths, the term average.
do you see? They're all linked but to this, this handshape here, which represents the range of numbers that are involved in each of these terms. And all of those, those signs developed based around that root sign. Here's another example. The family of signs around cells. So you again see that they're all linked to this root sign for cell. So PSL, as I mentioned earlier, has its own phonology, but it's not like spoken language phonology. It is based on these five parameters, hand shape, orientation, location on the body, movement, and facial expression. And these five elements combine to create one sign. So, for example, if one of these parameters changes, it will change the meaning of a sign. Let me think of an example to show you. So this is a sign for number. But if you change the hand shape to this, it means how much? Number, you see, just the only thing that has changed there is one parameter of hand shape. If we change the parameter of orientation, this means Britain. If we change the orientation, the sign now means today. Location on the body. This wiggly finger movement on the cheek means when, and this means how much on the chin. So you see the location is the only parameter that has changed. Movement, this is the sign for bread. But if we change the movement, that's the sign for true. Facial expression, finally. This is the sign for happy, the nice smiley face, not happy. So the manual sign is the same, and the only changes in facial expression. These are some of the other things we considered. Sometimes we borrowed signs from other sign language, languages because they had a perfect example that matched the principles of BSL as a language, so we were able to incorporate that into the glossary. We used compounding, compounding which is two signs that are brought together to change the meaning. So this sign this round object, this um, pointy finger sign is negative, but when you combine them, you have the negative electron circling the nucleus, which means atom. We use sign simultaneity. Number itself becomes prime number. We simplify signs. Because, for example, there might be several signs that we could use, um, one sign for each of the inner planets, for example. So for inner planets, we simplify that. And it would be sun and four planets, but we simplify it to these four fingers moving around the sun to indicate the inner planets. Iconicity is another consideration. This is a sign for volcano. You can see it's a mountain that isn't complete. It's got a hole at the top. And I've given you already some examples of the morphological families. Mean, mode, median. So we use that kind of principle to create families of sounds, and uh, families of signs. And the team all work together to make sure that we create clear visual signs that match the concepts. And our aim is to make sure that deaf children can get access to scientific concepts. And actually, maybe some of you might find the signs useful to help you remember some scientific terminology. Thank you all very much.